the cultural sensitivities uh, without uh, realizing the cultural sen sensitivities there is no hope for uh, cross cultural communication and that is why for a diplomat culture assumes an entirely different proportion uh, it was uh, if I may be allowed to say, it was the uh, it was uh, diplomacy's role that the modern form of cultural studies perhaps uh, were facilitated. I would like to quote the example of uh, Edward E. Hall, uh, one of my favorite favorite cultural theorists, uh, who came up with the ideas of uh, high context and low, low low context cultures, and it was during training the American diplomats that he came up with his theories and his, and, and his books. So culture and diplomacy uh, go hand in hand. Uh, there is one difference though. Uh, in diplomacy, diplomacy is conducted in an environment of what we call real politic. It is the realism in, of international politics. Which, which drives, which governs the diplomatic practice. And uh, sometimes cultural issues complicate the calculations of realism. I will, I will uh, like to cite an example. In the year 2010, uh, the US government, the US Congress, gave Pakistan uh, a uh, aid in the form of a bill called Carrie Luger Bill. According to the provisions of the bill, uh, under the Carrie Luger uh, Agreement, the government of Pakistan, the Pakistani people, would get $1.5 billion per year for four years. That was a huge amount. Uh, but surprisingly, as the bill was passed by the American Congress, there were public protests in Pakistan, street protests. People were protesting against America giving Pakistan aid. It was sort of a, a strange situation. A country is giving you free money, and that too, a substantial amount, and the people are protesting that they don't want the money. At the heart of the problem was cultural sensitivities. The language used in the bill was such that the people of Pakistan thought that they have been disrespected, humiliated in the bill. And hence, this whole uh, program of, uh, of protests. The, the situation was so serious that uh, the then Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, came to Pakistan for about uh, a week. And she interacted with people at every level, students, civil societies, journalism, journalists, every walk of life, common people. And she explained the position of the government of the US. And finally, the matter was resolved. Uh, so this problem, this episode, uh, gives us two uh, lessons. One is that whatever the calculations of uh, realism, realpolitik, culture can complicate the conduct of diplomacy if, it is, if its sensitivities are not undertaken in view. Second, Conclusion is, second lesson is, that effective communication can bridge the cultural gap. So this divide between the, the realist calculation and the cultural emotions of a people is nothing new. I just gave the example of it on a smaller scale. But we are having this problem afresh today. And the theater for that unfortunately, is Europe. Uh, the, the objective situation in the Europe has changed a little bit. Uh, let me give you a few examples. 
uh, Europe was about 25% of the population of the world, uh, maybe 100 years ago. Today, it is perhaps below 7%. Uh, Europe was a traditional, is a traditional leader in scientific, technological advancement, innovation. But last year, the intellectual property patents in China were double the amount of all put together by the Western countries. The level of inno the rest, the, the rise of Asia. The, the, the population, uh, the demographic change has changed uh, the situation for European policymakers quite a bit. The most important element in this calculation, in the calculation of, of, of uh, realpolitik, has been the concept of freedom of democracy, freedom and democracy. Uh, I give you another example. I was going through uh, a fellowship in the NATO Defense College in, in Rome, and we were taken to, uh, to meet, uh, to have meetings at the uh, NATO headquarters in Brussels. And we had this conversation with the Deputy Secret Secretary General of NATO, who is invariably uh, an American diplomat. And uh, I asked him about the, the the, co the complexities, the increasing complexities that the uh, operations of NATO is facing in the world. And uh, he acknowledged the problems, but he had a very interesting conclusion. Uh, he told me that we will prevail in the end because we have freedom and democracy on our side. And he's right. The concept, the power of the ideas of freedom and democracy is such that it has, it has made the West sort of, uh, in my calculation, prevail even during the Cold War. It was not the hard power which won the Cold War. It was the soft power. It was the power of these ideas of freedom and democracy which, which made the West win. But these very ideals are now uh, being challenged. Uh, last year, 49% uh, of, the, of the Europeans, half of Europe, thought that their national identities were under threat. Uh, in 2014, there were about 130, 40 attacks on the asylum seekers in, in Germany. In 2015, that was, there were 1,100 attacks. In 2016, there were almost 2,000 attacks on refugees. Mm -hmm. so what is happening? What, uh, the, at the source of the idea of uh, freedom and democracy, there is this challenge which is, which is enshrined in the, in, the, in the language of culture and it is challenging the, the, the notions which had been uh, prevalent for the last century. So uh, there, can be, there can be many reasons, many explanations. What is happening and why is it happening? Uh, we have heard uh, Hillary Clinton say ab about this basket of d deplorables, the people who, s who support the, the, the far right. Uh, we have heard about the theories that the peoples who that the people who who did not benefit from globalization are primar primarily leading this uh, cultural charge. Uh, but the matter of fact is that, uh, according to the surveys, 80 percent of the voters of AFD. Claim that their financial situation is either good or very good. Uh, it is not, in the case of Germany at least, it is not the economic deprivation which is driving this cultural blowback. So, uh, for a diplomat, this is a very tricky situation. We we work 
on the very simple cold logic of national interest. We have no room for emotions, for, uh, for words like uh, 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 betrayal and friendship, and these, these emotions are all there, but the affair of state are beyond these things. They are traditionally, they have been, they have been based on pure uh, calculations of interest. Now that notion, that whole understanding is, is being challenged. And that, I think, ladies and gentlemen, is a very important point. The way these forces of what one German historian called, and I love the phrase, he said, this is the politics of cultural despair. And uh, this, this uh, is the challenge. The way Europe will deal with this issue will determine the, the shape of international politics for the years to come. Uh, I am personally hopeful that rationality will always trump uh, and, uh, and the emotions uh, will, will subside. But the fact remains that the outcome of this, this, uh, this present stage or in cultural politics will very much determine the shape of interna international politics in the next decade. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Kerry Luger Bill, Pakistan's uh, relation with, uh, with the US are about 70 years old. And Kerry Luger Bill in 2009 and 10 was the first instance in 70 years when aid has been provided to the civilian side. This was the first aid package which the American government designed for the civilian population of Pakistan. Before before uh, in the earlier days, all aid that <coughs> Pakistan received were, was primarily in the domain of defense. So nobody ever knew how much money is coming and how, it, how much is, it, is this being spent. But this was the first effort. And uh, I'm a great fan of the, of the late Mr. Richard Holbrook. We, I've learned a lot from him. And it was his, his idea and a right one. But the, the thing which was missed was this small uh, uh, attention to detail to, uh, to, you, to, to fix the language of the bill. That created the problem, in my view. And may I just ask one question about uh, cultural relations between the Muslim world and the West, because we are meeting here in Germany, and you represent Pakistan. I do remember the great impact, the scholarship and teaching of Anamari Schimmel, the <coughs> train expert of Islam, did have on uh, debates on Islam here and how much her work was appreciated in Pakistan. Even street was named after her. And the same one could say about the Austrian scholar in an earlier period who converted to Islam, Mohammed Assad, who did uh, brilliant work yes. in uh, explaining Islam also to the West. And again, uh, Pakistan is uh, remembering him at uh, a very 
with special respect and appreciation. Yes. Is that not a good or at least a positive sign? What uh, could have an impact yes. in the present situation, which has deteriorated so much? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, both the names, uh, Mohammed Asad. Uh, 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 I think if anybody is ever interested, the best translation of Quran uh, in English is by Muhammad Asad. And that is because of his, his understanding of the language when he spent his days with the Bedouins in, in, in Saudi Arabia. And Mary Shmil, amazing woman. So what, what did these, especially Anne Mary Shmil, what did they do? You see, uh, we, we had colonialism. And when colonialism came to, uh, to India, uh, which was ruled by Muslims, and the official language was Persian, our whole history, our whole uh, tradition was preserved in the per Persian language. And uh, when the British came, uh, one uh, gentleman by the name of Lord McCoyle, he, by the stroke of one pen, uh, banned Persian and English became the, uh, the official language. So what it did was that it denied the subsequent generations of Muslims living in India with a connection with their past. So I can't, uh, I can't understand Persian. Uh, my, neither did my father and grandfather. And because of that, they could not read, say, Rumi. They could not read the text written by scholars a uh, hundred years ago. But what Anne Mary Schmill did, Anne Mary Schmill provided us with a bridge. Because of her work, people like me got connected with Rumi. They got connected with so many other writers. And sh these people brought our culture, our tradition back to us. And uh, in the spirit of your question, sir, that is the only uh, answer, uh, education, communication, and respect. That is the only answer to the problems that we are facing. And uh, with the practitioners sitting here, uh, everybody of us have a huge responsibility. So let's hope things get better, sir. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir.